thank you. Thank you very much for that fantastic reception. And thanks to all the other speakers for what they've just said. And uh, John Landsman asked you to donate five or ten pounds to the campaign if you can. And we're very grateful if you do. Because I tell you this, this campaign has uh, not received any offers of corporate money. <laughs> so we haven't had to go through the role of um, refusing any offers of corporate donations to our campaign because none have been made to us. And the donations we've had, we're very, very grateful to them. They've either come from trade unions or from people sending small amounts of money. I am much happier with a large number of small donations of people all over the country who want to be part of a movement of hope, of determination and of optimism of what we can all achieve together. And I want to say a big thank you to all of you for being here today and all those volunteers that have organised this event because these things don't happen by accident. Politics changes when people come together. Politics changes when people come together in a spirit of determination to ensure something better. All those volunteers that came together to organise today's event. Give them a big round of applause and say thank you very much for everything you've done. And thank you to those unions that are here today. I've seen an RMT banner out there. I'm very pleased to see the Unite tent over there because our party and our unions are working together. We were founded by trade unions. Working class communities wanting a political voice is what brought the Labour Party into being in the first place. Cornwall was of course the very heart of the Industrial Revolution in Britain. The steam engine came here, the Trevethix invention, the development of the mines and so much other technology came from this county. This very place is a symbol of the mining industry that once was and the technology that went with it. And whilst we always remember the great engineers, Trevethix, Brunel and so many others, think for a moment of those that worked in those mines, those that built those railways, and those that died in the process of doing it. And it was the Industrial Revolution that founded the trade unions in many ways and founded the Labour Party with it. So this rally today is symbolic of many things. It's symbolic because Cornwall is a very different and very special place. But it's symbolic because we are campaigning in this leadership election, as in any other election, in every single part of the United Kingdom. And I tell you, since we launched our campaign on the 21st of July, we've already held rallies in Salford, Durham, York, Hull, Leeds, Liverpool, Brighton, Cardiff, Merthyr Tidville, Swansea, here today, and then we're off to Bristol, then we're off to Liverpool again, and we're off to Manchester, we're off to the North East, we're off to Scotland, we're off to Birmingham, we're off to every single part of this country to give that message that we can and will do politics very differently within our society because it's a message of how we want to achieve things. Now, last year, we lost a general election. We were devastated by that defeat. I was absolutely devastated by it because I wanted to be in Parliament with a Labour majority to build houses, to give better employment protection, to invest rather than destroy industries in this country. I wanted to be there to do that. I'm proud to be in Parliament, but obviously we're not in a majority. We all understand that. But then you think back and analyse what happened. And whilst there were many, many very, very good things in the manifesto on which we fought the 2015 election, the fundamental problem was that we hadn't challenged the idea that you deal with the financial crisis brought about by the greed, irresponsibility of the banking community by cutting...
public services, freezing wages and damaging the life chances of a whole generation of young people. We hadn't crossed that Rubicon of saying we were going to do things very, very differently. And so, last year, we had the leadership election. And it was an amazing experience. As you all know, it was very easy for the nomination to be obtained to go on the ballot paper, and it was obtained with plenty of time to spare, in fact, one minute, 50 seconds, until such time as uh, it would have been too late. And that campaign brought a lot of people together. Brought them together, not around personal personalities or personal issues, brought them together on the kind of Labour Party they wanted, on the kind of politics they wanted, the kind of inclusivity we wanted, and the way in which we understand and respect each other and we respect each other's point of view and recognize that every single one of us has ideas, has imagination that should be part of our policy making and part of our growth as a movement. So we bring people with us rather than offer them something we will feed down from high above just before the next general election. It's a very different way of doing politics and I have to say some of the national media are finding it quite hard to understand. But we're helping them. And I have to say I'm very grateful to one newspaper which by an analysis done by the uh, uh, LSE and other universities have done lots of academic studies of media coverage of the Labour Party over the past year has um, done 86% of its stories have been downright hostile to the Labour Party. 16% have been adjudged to be broadly informative or neutral. So far, there's been not one positive thing whatsoever in that newspaper. But today it's changed. There is a positive article in that paper. Mainly because I wrote it and sent it to them. <laughs> And so we are reaching out. But for all the media attacks and disinterest, two things have happened. One is social media is a way of reaching a whole different spectrum of people. And uh, I'll give you an example of how powerful this can be. When we stood up in Parliament to criticise the government's programme, the programme they're now trying to push through in Parliament, we got two million people following it and watching it live on Facebook, as we do for pretty well all of our rallies and all of our events. It's not the be-all and end-all of everything, but it is a way of reaching out. And for those who are sceptical of... Uh, the success of the party over the past year, I simply give them two figures. At the time of the 2015 general election, Labour Party membership was just around 200,000. A good figure, yes, but not enough. Today, Labour Party membership is 540,000. That's in just over a year. It's gone up to that figure with the largest socialist party across the whole continent. And when I attend meetings of the Party of European Socialists, we sit around a big table and discuss lots of things, and at the end they all turned to me and said, what is it in Britain that people are joining the Labour Party in such numbers? And I say, it's because people want to come together to propose an alternative economic, social, community and cultural strategy for their lives and their community and their country. And so we are having a leadership election, of course, and uh, that this leadership election gives us the chance to reach out to even more people and also reach out to those communities that have been left behind in free market Tory Britain where unemployment is rife, where poverty wages are rife, where industries have disappeared, where financial services are the only thing on option. We've, we have to reach out to all of those communities. Nowhere more so than in the southwest of England and particularly in Devon and Cornwall. 
the lowest wages are in Devon and Cornwall across the whole of the UK. The need for infrastructure and other investment is nowhere greater than in Devon and Cornwall, as well as, of course, in the northeast and to some extent in some parts of the northwest of England. There is a grotesque imbalance in the way in which the economy is run in our society and the wage levels that are with it. If you take 100 as the median for the whole country in contribution to gross product, Cornwall comes out at 62. In other words, this county is underinvested in, this county has the lowest wages, this county has far too many insecure jobs on zero hours contracts and all the insecurity that goes with that. It can and should be done very, very differently indeed. It has to be done. Cornwall had European Union Objective 1 status and it still does. It has that because of the levels of poverty, because of the levels of underinvestment that exist across this county. And so what we're proposing will make a very, very big difference. Last week, John McDonnell was in this county giving the message out about how we can do things differently. Differently, first of all, by investment to ensure there is a better electrified railway system across the whole of the southwest, which in turn would help promote jobs and industry across the whole region. And that there is proper access to fast broadband across the whole of the area, as it should be, as it should be in every part of the country. But above all, it's also about investment in the issues that matter to people. Housing is a crucial issue across the whole of Britain. We have the most expensive housing of most parts of Europe in Britain. We have a decline in the number of owner-occupiers. We have a big increase in the number of people living in private rented accommodation. And we have a government that is determined to underfund, under-resource and attack every local authority that tries to build council housing. And indeed, if they're in high cost areas, force them to sell off the most valuable property and introduce pay to stay for those that do a bit better and want to still remain living in council housing. I'm unashamed and not afraid to say it. Council housing developed particularly after the end of the Second World War, gave an opportunity and a life chance to people that would never have had it if they were stuck in an unregulated private rented sector with no real security of tenure. So when we say we want a million new homes built during the first, the first period of a Labour government, we mean it. And we mean it because we want the majority of those to be council housing with lifetime secure tenancies. Because there is something very bad about children being brought up in insecure accommodation. They don't know where they're going to be living in a few months time. It's not right that in uh, seaside towns and areas where the tourist industry is at its strongest, the only time you can rent a decent flat is during the winter months when there's no holiday lets available. Then you have to move out to try and survive somewhere else or go somewhere else. So there has to be an investment in housing all across the region. What they've done in St Ives and other places in challenging the whole question of second home ownership and the ghost-like appearance of villages dominated by second homes has to be addressed with secure housing for the entire community. That is best done by public investment in it. And when people say, well, this costs a lot of money, I simply say this, yes, it does. But you can save a lot of money in another way. If we're using the housing benefit system to pay into high cost private sector rents, how about having social level rents at the council level, not paying for them by the public purse, but instead investing in the bricks and mortar, which will give people secure housing and in turn create the jobs and in turn create the supply chain of jobs in those that want to contribute to it. A lot can be done by what I call social investment in the needs of people. 
And there are other issues that are special and particular to this region. One of which, of course, is energy and energy production. We were thinking about our policies and discussing them a great deal, how we develop a secure form of energy supply in Britain in the future. The big six are very powerful and control quite a lot, but they're controlling less and less of the energy market. What we've looked at, and my good friend Alan Simpson, a former Labour MP who's now helping us a great deal with this energy policy, has talked a great deal about the way forward is to empower local communities to develop their own energy generation. Much more solar, much more wind, much more wave power, much more sustainable. And by investing in sustainable energy, you also create a spin-off in the jobs. And so. Last month, I was uh, the month before, I was visiting a factory in Widnes that makes the towers for wind turbines. And they were doing very well. They're making these towers where the turbine blades are fitted at the top. They're not simple, they're complicated to make, and they were doing very well at it because we had the feed-in tariffs that the last Labour government had put in. A very good idea because it helped to develop the whole idea of a sustainable energy product, project in Britain. They cut the feed-in tariffs down. As a result, the whole industry has been badly affected. Can we not invest by, yes, restoring a higher level of feed-in tariff and taper it over a longer period in order to develop our own sustainable energy industry in this country? It's good for all of us. Again, good for investment, good for energy security, and good for jobs. And so that has to be an important way forward. The other is, other issues are many, but one of course is the idea that in the national narrative, poverty is a city issue, prosperity is a rural issue, and Cornwall is an idyllic place, a great place to come on a holiday. Yes, it is a great place to come on a holiday, and I love visiting, but that's not the point. The point is, there are many village communities with chocolate box beauty about them, hiding desperate isolation and poverty in those villages. So there has to be investment, investment in housing, investment in energy, investment in better communications, but also an improved public transport system. I talked about the railways and I feel very passionately about railways as the most efficient and environmentally sustainable way of improving transport particularly over long distances and commuter distances. But there has to be rural bus services which ensures that villages are not totally cut off. And again, that requires investment, but you get it back. You get it back because you keep jobs in the area, you keep jobs in the villages, you enable people to live in those communities. That surely has to be the right way of doing things. So what we're doing is developing a series of policies which will make a massive difference to the lives of the vast majority of people in this country. The fundamental question is economic in many ways, and I want to say a big thank you to my good friend John McDonnell, who is our Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer, because after John took that role on last September, the first thing he did was set out the basic economic principles. The basic economic principles actually boil down to this. Austerity that we've had for the past six years and has given us greater levels of inequality rather than equality has hit the poorest the hardest, has hit women the hardest across our society, has hit every public service and taken money out of the pockets of every public employee is actually a political choice, not an economic necessity. So John has set out a different way of doing a different way of doing our economic business in this country. And the strange thing is, a year later, there are many people who throw many criticisms at many of us, and I take uh, no problem with any of that. People can throw anything they like. It doesn't matter because I'm not going to throw anything back other than what I believe to be good sense because good sense is more powerful than abuse. Yeah. 
But you can hardly find anybody now who doesn't agree with John McDonnell about investment in the economy. So when we put together our ten points of how we want to approach our politics in Britain, I won't go through them all in too much detail because that would take too long and the sun would set and we'd still be here, but essentially it goes something like this. Can't we as a party and a movement say unashamedly we want to create an economy of full employment, job opportunities for all within our society, rather than relying on the pool of unemployment, underemployment, casual employment, insecure employment. That we want to invest in dealing with the housing crisis across the whole of Britain. Because, as I've said, there are issues of insecurity, but there's also the immorality of so many people sleeping on the streets of major towns and cities all across the country. If you go to a park in a major urban area in Britain, go there on a summer's evening about eight, nine o'clock when the sun is beginning to go down and the park workers are closing up the park for the night. The public have enjoyed the park are going home for the evening. There's a quieter army of people going into the park. They're the homeless who are looking for a bench to sleep for the night. Is that right? Is it necessary? Is it acceptable in 21st century Britain that we just assume there is a, always going to be a band, an army of homeless people looking for somewhere to put their head down for the night. Cannot we develop a housing policy that does provide housing for all and security for all and be prepared to invest in it? It wasn't always like that and it will not be like that in the future if we have anything to do with it. And the questions of security at work are so important. I talked about zero hours contracts and inequality and underpayment. We want a living wage that is a living wage and we want employers that understand that. BHS, tax havens, denuded pension funds, all those kind of things, that's a product of a government that believes in the free market, not of intervention. Sport Direct, and what they've done to the workers there at Shirebrook. That is what free markets do. That is what, when there is unregulation, does to people. It's not right, not acceptable, and so we will crack down on all of that, and crack down on it by also enforcing a rule that every company with more than 250 employees must negotiate with appropriate trade unions on wages and conditions so that we have a stronger representation in a democratic way of the workforce in our company. I am very proud of our health service, very proud indeed of our health service. It was a labour creation, it was an R.M. Bevan's greatest legacy to all of us. Health service, free at the point of use, as a human right for all. It's being privatised, 49% put out to the pri private sector. It's being underfunded, every hospital is in debt, every health authority, every commissioning group has trouble balancing the books. It needs proper public investment. We also need to tackle health inequality. Why is it life expectancy is lowest in the poorest areas and highest in the richest areas of this country? We need health investment as well as housing investment and environmental investment that will help to chase that down. We also need real parity of esteem for mental health as opposed to physical health. A quarter of us are gonna suffer mental health problems during our lifetime. Let's do it differently, invest in mental health service and change the language where mental health is concerned. It could affect any of us or all of us during our lifetime. Be proud enough and strong enough to care. There are many other issues, but I just want to mention a couple more, if I may. One is about how we treat our environment, how we try to live on a sustainable planet, how we protect the natural world and how we promote green energy and green jobs. It cannot be done just within national frontiers. 
Polluted water flows from one place to another. Polluted air blows from one place to another. Fish move from one place to another. You have to work internationally with other countries on this. I went to the Paris Climate Change Conference out of fascination, out of interest and out of absolute determination that a Labour government will sign up to everything that is necessary to do our best to make our planet more sustainable, make our communities more sustainable, and our education system bring up our children to understand the limits to exploitation of natural resources and develop green industries, green energy, and the jobs that go with it. It doesn't have to be a threat to people. It can be something very, very inclusive. I'm getting lots of signals about the time this speech is taking, and so I'll tell you just a couple of other things. I said three. Equality, thank you very much. Who's the supporter there who said more? <laughs> Equality within our society is very necessary. The human rights that we enjoy, our right to free speech, our right to assembly, our right to religious freedom, our right to diversity, our right to practice our faith are very, very important. They're enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948. They're enshrined in the European Declaration of Human Rights. Why do we allow our media to keep on putting the line before it saying the controversial Human Rights Act? What's controversial about those rights? What's controversial about anything that I just said? If the Tories come after our Human Rights Act, we will absolutely oppose them. And if they try and withdraw from the European Convention, we will oppose them. We will support yet the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and equality within our society. Equality in the treatment of people, equality to end the gender pay gap, equality to end any form of race discrimination, institutional or otherwise, within our society, any form of discrimination on the basis of age, and of course, any form of discrimination on the basis of disability, which this government has systematically cut benefits. And whilst we did defeat them when they tried to take away personal independence payments, we've got to look again at the way in which they're doing these capability to work assessments and the appalling effect that has on individuals. I believe very strongly in a world of peace. Today is the anniversary of the dropping of nuclear weapons on Hiroshima and a few days later on Nagasaki. People died as a result of that. The cancers went on for decades and decades and indeed nuclear test veterans from the Pacific are still suffering, Pacific Islanders are still suffering, people in Russia, people in the United States are still suffering from it. I want us to have a Labour government that takes its responsibilities in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty absolutely seriously and to the letter so that we promote a nuclear-free world in the future. And I believe very much in a world of peace and justice. And having opposed the Iraq War, and uh, warning of the consequences of it. We have to be at the forefront in our foreign policy of, and our trade policies of promoting human rights, environmental sustainability and justice. And recognize the refugee crisis facing this world at the present time is the worst there's ever been in recorded history. Look at the causes of it and look at the need for a humanitarian response to it. That surely has to be the right way forward. And so our party has grown in the past year. Our party has changed in the past year. And if I may say so, the political discourse has changed in the past year. Because if people throw abuse around, at the end it doesn't work. All it does is cheapens the whole political debate. By our refusal to engage in that style of Yabu politics, in that style of remote, witty theatre at the expense of real concern about people all over the country, I think we have begun to make a change. That's why so many people have come into the Labour Party. And we've got a long way to go. We've got a long way to go in order to ensure we bring more people in 
and we campaign in all those communities that have been left behind in modern Britain. Places that lost their industry, places that became centres of high unemployment and poverty, places that became desperate, places that were turning in on each other rather than out towards each other. So, if people are going to start blaming minorities for the shortage of housing, the shortage of schools, the shortage of doctors, the shortage of any other public facility, I simply say this to them. Doing things together makes you stronger. Bringing people together makes us all stronger. When we do things together, we build an NHS, we build those council housings, we build those schools, we redevelop the community of education, we develop the community of everything else. That surely is what makes us much more powerful as a community and as a party. But it's also about how we do things culturally. Because in every one of us there is imagination, in every child there is hope, there is painting, there is drawing, there is poetry, there is music. Can we not be proud of it and invest in it, proud of the cultural community, which is at the heart of so much of our, of so much of our lives? And so I want to see a Labour government in Britain that is investing in the social needs of people, that is investing in an economy that does provide jobs for all and does provide reasons for excitement but also hope and opportunities for all young people all across the country so that no one community is left behind that nobody is left behind so this leadership campaign gives us the chance to reach out in a way that we wouldn't otherwise have so in that sense i'm grateful for it we've got a long way to go and a lot more rallies and meetings and events that we're going to do together but this is a preparation for when we're going to have to do it all again to ensure that we win a general election for every part of the United Kingdom. And this county of Cornwall, with all its history, with all its excitement and its beauty, and all the chances and opportunities there, I fully get that sense of community that is all across this county. That sense of the culture, the history and the spirit of this county. That is why we're not just going to be here a couple of times in this campaign. I want to see the Labour Party fully engaged because we've got the biggest growth in membership by proportion of almost any region in the country in the South West. And I'm proud of that. I'm grateful for all those that have joined. Kanabis Vakameras. Thank you very much. Well, thank you everyone now. Jeremy's given us a fantastic speech, a lot of inspirational stuff there.